Whether you operate one forklift or thousands, one location or hundreds, the new My Toyota customer portal can help you optimize your operation and material handling equipment. This one-stop, free-to-use platform is designed to help you take control of your information and make smarter decisions, all at the touch of a button. Register and access your data today at my.toyotaforklift.com. That's my.toyotaforklift.com. Hello, and thank you for being a listener. Before we get into the episode, I wanted to let you know about a special offer being given to the new warehouse listener. That's you. Mobile Robot Guide is offering 10% off just for you when you purchase the Warehouse Solutions Buyer's Guide. Just use promo code WarehousePod10 at MobileRobotGuide.com. That's WarehousePod10. This is your comprehensive guide for all things autonomous mobile robots. That's Warehouse Pod 10. And for more info, go to thenewwarehouse.com. The New Warehouse Podcast, hosted by Kevin Lawton, is your source for insights and ideas from the distribution, transportation, and logistics industry. A new episode every Monday morning brings you the latest from industry experts and thought leaders. And now, here's Kevin. Hey, it's Kevin Lawton with the New Warehouse Podcast, bringing you a new episode today. Today on the show, I'm going to be joined by Jen Ward, and she is the Offering Manager for Mobility Solutions at Peak Rizex. Uh, we've had some people on before from uh, Peak, and she's going to talk to us a little bit more about some things that have been going on in terms of uh, mobility solutions in the supply chain uh, in regards to COVID. Um, everybody's, uh, well, not favorite word, but definitely a hot topic, I would say. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about some sanitization things. What can people do to keep employees safe in terms of utilizing mobile solutions? And also a little bit about um, UV light as well, which I'm pretty interested to hear about um, from Jen. So, Jen, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate being on here. Yeah, thanks for coming on. We're uh, happy to uh, talk to you. So, so tell us a little bit about uh, Peak Rizex and what it is you guys do. Absolutely. So Peak Rizex is a provider of end-to-end digital supply chain and logistic solutions. Basically what that means is if you need to move it, pack it, ship it, store it, or track it, we will be happy to help you with any of those projects. Uh, we've been around for quite a while. We were incorporated back in 1981, and we have approximately 500 employees across North America and Europe. We have uh, approximately 6,000 active customers, mm-hmm. and we are very proud to say that over 60% of our customer base is uh, Fortune 500 companies. And uh, we definitely specialize in high velocity supply chains and uh, keeping people and product moving. Uh, We're very top-level partners with Zebra, Honeywell, Samsung, and uh, any other major AIDC and software provider that enables the supply chain. All right, cool. So so really kind of all over the place in terms of the supply chain you guys cover, it sounds like from end-to-end, like you said, um, and definitely working with a lot of um, providers that we've also had on the show as well, like Zebra and Honeywell, too. Um, so, Absolutely. yeah, and you mentioned there, you know, a fast pace moving, um, business, um, which is pretty much the nature of, uh, warehousing and supply chain these days. So, you know, I'm curious, even, you know, before the pandemic, obviously, um, e-commerce continuing to grow and fulfillment and warehousing, but what, what have you guys seen on, on your end in terms of the business and like how, how has it changed with COVID? Um, and you know, what, what are customers, what has like, okay, been their reaction and what are they kind of coming to you guys for? Absolutely. So we've definitely seen a lot of changes, some good, some not. Um, and we've seen a massive uptick in some specific subsets of our business, mm. including those that are providing last mile, the distribution centers that support e-commerce, e-commerce and omni-channel fulfillment. Uh, we've seen a wide variety of business impact, whether it is significant increases in areas such as athletic apparel or food production or distribution, um, and even companies that have restructured their management 
manufacturing facilities to aid in the production and the manufacture of, of PPE supplies, which was definitely an, a, an interesting and pleasant surprise for us. We've also seen some significant decreases, uh, specifically in the areas of um, hospitality or those that are producing supplies for hospitality. So it has definitely been across the board. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's been interesting to see how uh, different businesses have reacted and like what some, what businesses I guess have been heard. And then, like you said, even some businesses, how they've kind of pivoted. So, so actually interested in that. So, you know, when you talk about, you know, some manufacturing facilities, how they pivoted and it, there was like a bunch of stories going around about how um, these different companies were now making PPE, I guess most commonly, it seemed like a lot of companies were chipping in and making masks and things like that. So, you know, what, what's, I guess, maybe an example of something that you guys got involved in? What, what, did, what did it really take to be able to make that kind of switch? Well, one of the specific examples was actually a significant increase in mobile computing and mobile mm. computers that were distributed to that particular customer. Uh, for example, they went to a one-to-one model. A lot of the companies that we work with previously had one to many. And so it was one device for each person on the shift or a shared device for multiple people on the shift. We definitely saw an increase of companies adopting a one to one policy, meaning there was one device that was assigned to any em- or to a specific employee uh, across whatever shift that we're dealing with. In addition, some of the changes have actually been. Um, enabling the safety of employees and keeping their employees safe. So, of course, we've seen some common requests across what we call low-tech, such as physical barriers and safety labels and signage, all the way up through high-tech, such as employee locationing, and uh, which includes the monitoring of distance between employees, as well as contact tracing. It's, uh, it's quite an in-depth category and a lot of changes that have happened, um, and we've definitely gotten more involved in a lot of the categories that we were perhaps dabbling in before or had specific subsets, but now have definitely been uh, increased to a more broad category. Mm-hmm. We tend to break those safety solutions down into four primary categories. Uh, first one being distancing, second one being sanitization, which I know you mentioned some UV light. And you have some questions about that upcoming, which is great. Right. Uh, tracking and tracing and health screening. And within each of those four, it breaks down even further. So some of the most common requests we've seen keeping their employees safe uh, for distancing, for example, is floor signage, directional signs, Mm -hmm. such as like those non-slip labels and non-slip signs that you see even at the grocery store that tells people to stay six feet back or you can only go this way down the aisle and, uh, and things of that nature. Uh, some of the more complex distancing opportunities are having each employee armed with a device that tracks them anywhere in the warehouse. And it can buzz or beep um, if the employee gets too close to each other. And it can also record any of the instances that there was that um, distance that was not uh, maintained. Interesting. What I'm curious, what does that kind of thing look like? Is it like a like a bracelet or like a clip-on thing? What What is that like? There's actually several form factors. So there's the little beacons that can be worn as a lanyard around the neck or um, mm. clipped onto the belt buckle, or it can even use the existing mobile computing devices or personal cell phones or personal devices. And of course, it depends on which type of facility you're in. For example, if you're in food production, you can't use your own personal device because the screen is most likely glass and you can't have glass in food production facilities Um, but also you have to be aware of certain things like the battery drainage when you're using bluetooth from a beacon and things of that but it's definitely an interesting and strongly emerging um, uh, opportunity for us here yeah so is that i'm curious you know because i'm thinking um, of other applications for that too as well is that something that could be used to track like even like where your hot spots are, where people are doing a lot of, I guess, traveling within the, the warehouse? Yes, absolutely. 
it can track the hotspots, it can track the areas of uh, what we would call um, accumulation, employee accumulation, if right. there's a lot of employees that are in a specific area or high touch points. Um, so, for example, we see a lot of printing in the warehouse. So, if you have one printer that's being used more than others, you can see where the employees have gone, where how long they've been in a particular area of the warehouse or the distribution center, and uh, how long they resided in that area, and you can make accommodations for your processes based on that intelligent data. Mm, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, I like that that has um, kind of an application for the now, right, and dealing with the safety of social distancing and COVID. Um, but then it also has kind of like a, a long-term application that you can actually use to improve your overall uh, workflow as well. Absolutely. And then speaking of workflow too, we can look at the different ways to adopt some changes. Uh, we've seen an increase in the request for mobile powered carts. Uh, one of the things that we've recommended um, throughout this entire um, pandemic is the use of one-to-one -one technology. I mentioned earlier about uh, an increase of mobile computing from a one-to-one -one perspective, but also printers become a, um, a point of discussion too. And so those mobile powered carts enable the printer to move with the person and stay in that designated um, area and production area mm. and uh, reduces the cross-contamination between the employees. Mm. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, I could see how that could uh, be effective. And I think it's actually some companies probably seeing the, the benefits of being more mobile as well um, and having more flexibility. And even though it's... Uh, kind of like a preventative measure but at the same time i feel like there's still um some opportunity to create better workflow like you're talking about as well um so i'm curious i want to go back to you You said some companies are moving from a one-to-many as you call them to a one-to-one -one. so yeah um in some cases you know for some companies i mean it can be possibly like a significant investment so is there options out there for different types of, I guess, uh, buying options to reduce the expense of going from the one-to-many model to the one-to-one -one model? Absolutely. We've definitely seen a lot of uh, focus on creative financing mm -hmm. and uh, the concept of device as a service or mobility as a service. Right. And so if you have a, um, a, you know, a large deployment, having it as an operational expense through a lease versus a capital expense through a purchase can help alleviate the initial pain of doing such a large investment. Uh, and then it becomes much more bearable to um, to shoulder the cost of keeping your employees safe and your business is running. And it's a lot easier to actually calculate some return on investments when you're able to look at a operational expense um, versus a capital expense. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's um, interesting. It seems like a lot of, a lot of things within our world are moving towards more of that type of model, including like robotics and stuff like that, which I think is, I think is really cool. I think, I think it's smart too, um, because it's like you said, it moves it to, um, OpEx instead of CapEx. So, um, absolutely. Yeah. And we're also seeing a lot of the soft costs now being able to be rolled into the leases and creative financing. Mm -hmm. Uh, the leases of old used to be hard costs only, um, and, uh, assets that, uh, were depreciating assets, whether it be a mobile computer or a robot or whatever it may be. Now all of the ancillary technologies and the, uh, software that's needed, or even the support plans, um, can be rolled into the, the leasing plans to make it much more palatable. We'll be back after a quick break. You hear a lot about supply chains these days, because if the past couple years have taught us anything, it's that an efficient, well-managed supply chain is absolutely critical to keeping businesses successful and consumers happy. I'm Will Haywood, and I host a podcast called All Business, No Boundaries, where we talk about supply chains, how they work, what happens when they don't, and the innovations that are redefining what's possible in the world of logistics. Join me for insightful interviews with thought leaders and industry experts. We discuss how optimizing supply chains can break down the barriers that are holding businesses back. That's All Business, No Boundaries by DHL Supply Chain. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really, um, a really cool model. I think that's... I think that's the way to go, personal opinion. But uh, Agreed. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it turns into a per user per month yeah. price versus a, a lump sum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think you you because you have um I mean correct me if I'm wrong but you have more more flexibility too if you have like units that um uh, get broken or not working it's it's easier to swap and you don't necessarily have to buy buy more buffer units just to have it also kind of reduces the cost i would think as well right absolutely and we're also seeing multimodal devices too so we live in the world of tablets or in phablets and these devices can have integrated scan engines and so they can be used within the warehouse uh, they can also be used for the the drivers for the last mile or for the um, transitional drivers in between and then it allows you to standardize on a single device or a single platform and it makes it easier to keep your spares pool or to always have devices on hand or to also minimize the strain on your IT department as the um, spectrum of the devices that they're maintaining mm. is um, is less daunting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So well, you said uh, a phablet. What's a phablet? I'm sorry. If I, it's I'm not a familiar. cross between a phone and a tablet. It's a. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I'm th- I was thinking of like a fabulous tablet. <laughs> oh, well, that works too. <laughs> that goes without saying. Oh, like a tablet. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Um, all right, so let, let, I guess let's get back a little to um, the cleaning and sanitization. And I, I'm actually more interested in this than uh, through our initial um, back and forth and emailing on topics here. But because uh, sort of like recently it was my birthday and, and my mom. Happy um, birthday. Thank you. Thank you. She, my mom is always, uh, she gets a little creative with the gifts. So um, she sent me this like UV uh phone spa like wand mm-hmm. thing to clean yeah. your phone and i i mean i guess it's cool but the one thing i was thinking is like you know i i don't really know if it's working so <laughs> like i guess like you know when you because she was like oh you know instead of like wiping your phone with the uh, lysol wipe or, or clorox wipe um you know, you just do this, but I'm like the wipe feels, you know, I feel like I'm doing something. So, so I guess, I guess tell us, you know, what, how does the UV light work and is it really something that's helping to sanitize devices and things within the warehouse? Oh, absolutely. And uh, I I can definitely see what you mean by being curious to see if it's actually doing anything. Uh, The type of UV light that you're referencing is UVC light, and Mm -hmm. it is definitely emerging as a way to handle sanitization of facilities and equipment. Uh, Essentially, UV light uses a UVC, which is non-visible light. So I'm not surprised that you're curious to see whether it's actually working or not because you can't see it. Yeah. And essentially what it does is it inactivates uh, any bacteria and viruses at the cellular level. And what this does is it prevents them from multiplying and causing any infection or any spread. Uh, mm-hmm. The eradication of viruses and bacteria uh, via this UVC light, it's accumulative on microorganisms, which means it continues to work. Uh, it's actually a pretty oh, cool technology. And uh, one of the reasons that this actually has become very popular, you mentioned having those wipes. Mm. Um, but a lot of people are sensitive to some of the uh, irritants or mm. um, or uh, um, components of those wipes. Mm. Um, and then also those wipes can damage electronics. So if the wipe has too much of the, the cleaning liquid on it, you don't want to have that going into your phone or into a fan on a laptop. Mm. Um, and with many companies trying to avoid the excessive chemical use, this UV light has actually become very, very popular. It's versatile and it's pretty easy. And it can be set up with that motion sensing to mm. ensure that it stays safe. Um, and this is essentially uses what's called a passive infrared sensor. Okay. And it allows for uh, the light to shut off if anybody's hand or face or body comes in line with that light. Okay. Because uh, oh, it's like, here, it's, it's, it can be harmful, right? To the skin. It can. Um, it can on people. <laughs> yeah. And so that's one of the reasons that we definitely recommend um, keeping the proper usage in mind, um, making sure that the product has the safety shut off aspect of it. So in other words, if your hand or a person walks into a UV light cleaning area, it will automatically shut off okay. um, using the safety sensors and using correct angles. 
Uh, but yeah, it's it's definitely something we've seen become a hot topic, um, and it's it's effective. So if you've got your phone, you use it as an example. Mm-hmm. Any surface that is exposed to that light is going to be sanitized, and in a relatively quick time frame, as little as two mi- or twenty seconds, um, three minutes is an average, depending on how far away the device is being sanitized mm. from the light source itself. Um, but also, what's notable is it's anywhere that that light is shined upon, which is also good and bad. And so, if you're cleaning multiple products underneath the light at the same time, that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. But if it's only getting one particular surface of that phone, for example, you would need to flip it over after the initial oh, UV light okay. sanitization cycle is done in order to make sure that the underside is clean too. Mm-hmm. And you talked about um, briefly about how effective it is, and uh, the UVC light's actually been proven to kill 99.9% of all bacteria, viruses, and even molds in mm-hmm. as little time as that 20-second sanitization cycle. And this does include the coronavirus, like COVID-19, and also other bacteria and viruses like salmonella, E. coli, even staph, strep, or influenza. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So I guess... I mean, I, I understand, you know, I understand the science and stuff, I guess, but like, how do you know, like, okay, um, this stuff is clean, right? So you, <laughs> like you put the light on and then it's just, you just, I guess, time it. And then at the end it's, it's, uh, presumably it's sanitized, right? It's as simple as that. Absolutely. Mm. And you can have it set so that it's a particular time frame or, uh, you know, if, uh, for example, if you have a payment terminal that has a UV light uh, attached to it, Mm. you know, if uh, it's gone within 30 seconds without use, it'll automatically start the, the cleaning cycle. You can even use, you just mentioned uh, the wand, um, Mm. and we've seen that across multiple instances. Um, One of the reasons the wand has become a real hot topic lately is because you can use it to clean um, surfaces that are irregular, um, and it's also able to be used across different parts of the warehouse. So say, for example, you have your employee login um, keypad that needs to be, you know, punched in by everybody. If you have the UV light that's cleaning that, uh, forklifts have um, many of them have the mobile, the vehicle mount units um, in, uh, installed on the forklift. So yeah. using the wand to clean the keypad on the vehicle mounted um, forklift computer. Uh, and even using it for multi-touch points, such as printers in the facility, having that wide range of ability to clean different areas is uh, is really quite unique and, and really interesting. And, you know, as we mentioned earlier, then you don't have to worry about liquids um, or chemicals damaging the right. surface of these these very valuable devices. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious, you know, because... Um, so I work as a warehouse manager as well and we, and we've been getting, uh, weekly sanitizations, which is like a a liquid spray. Basically it's a, like a Clorox 360 atomizer spray. Um, but (laughs) like you, like you said, um, it damages equipment, which we didn't realize in the beginning, I guess, you know, people still learning, I guess, um, and then we quickly found out that, you know, especially uh, screens, um, it's very damaging to screens. We had a printer where uh, it has a little touchscreen LCD thing. Uh, and I guess the stuff leaked into the screen and the printer, you couldn't use it anymore. Um, so, oh my. yeah, and we had some monitors as well that got some spots inside them. And um, so does this, does the UVC, I mean, essentially accomplish the same thing as these types of sprays and cleaners are doing it does it does Mm. and also to take that a little step further um, in the warehouse that you're talking about by disinfecting the equipment i'm assuming you're not talking about food products there are instances in warehouses where you can't have those chemicals cleaning a lot of those touch points because there's a risk for cross-contamination with some of the food products or the manufacturing facilities that have food Um, There's also been some real interesting technology advances by companies like Honeywell that are allowing their devices to be sanitized even with those chemicals 
that you reference mm. by having the um, the housing of the scanners or of the bubble computers themselves that are designed to be um, wiped down with uh, any type of um, cleansing alcohol or sanitization solution. They were typically only deployed in hospitals. Mm. Prior to now, but in light of COVID, Honeywell recognizes that there's a lot of other areas where devices are going to be regularly sprayed down, wiped down, or exposed to chemicals. And having that, um, the disinfectant ready housing um, keeps the devices much more safe. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that now it's probably just going to be, you know, people are just going to be cleaning more, more than ever. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> Which, uh, you know, we, we should have been cleaning before, but <laughs> uh, I guess, you know, we weren't as conscious of uh, germs and stuff like that before. At least I, I know I was, I think about, I, I'm so conscious of like how many doorknobs I, I touch now. It's crazy, but um, Isn't it? I never, th- I never thought about it before. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's really cool to see too, I think the kind of innovation that is uh, being pushed forward as well, like through this whole thing, even though it's like a terrible thing that happened and it's still happening. Um, there's still like a lot of innovation that's coming out of it, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, so the, the UV light, I mean, it's, if you're going to, so say you have like a warehouse, I mean, how, how big of a light do you need like per, however square footage or how, how do you even kind of gauge that? Uh, It really depends on what you're looking to sanitize and the type of surface and the type of environment that it is in. Uh, We've actually seen, I'm I'm sure everybody's seen on the news, these these little robots that are roaming around a a dark warehouse Mm -hmm. disinfecting surfaces. And and that's only a viable solution if there are times where the warehouses will be completely empty and you don't have the risk of an employee crossing in front of that UV light emitting robot. Uh, We also see that UV light robot cleaning in planes. Um, That was a topic on the news. And so having those uh, more intense UV light applications, for most of the warehouses that we're dealing with, they're offering 20 or they're operating 24 seven. And so having the several hours that would be needed for a robot to scan all of the areas of the facility is pretty unlikely. So having the mobile UVC light solutions is much more um, easy to deploy in those types of scenarios because you can have certain areas of the warehouse that are being cleaned at one time, certain areas that are being cleaned at others. And to know how many to deploy really depends on the types of surfaces that you're looking to clean, how many employees are in there, and the amount of hours that are available to designate towards cleaning, if any at all. Mm. Uh, Typically, the lights work best at a short distance rather than a long distance. Uh, We see instances where the lights are installed approximately eight feet above the surface that's being disinfected. Mm -hmm. And if there is an application like that, then the amount of time that would need need to be having the UVC light effectively cleaning uh, whatever it is that's being cleaned is much greater. Mm -hmm. So you could be looking at several hours before the UVC cleaning is effective at that level of a distance. Now, conversely, if you have a short amount of distance, meaning a couple of inches, even a foot, the time to sanitize it is much less. And uh, it also depends on, on, as I mentioned, what you're looking to sanitize. So if you're an IT department within the warehouse, then if you have a table of four or five laptops, then the surface is, although it sounds great seeing four or five laptops, you're only looking at a couple feet by a couple Mm. feet. So you may only need one or two of the UV lights. But if you're looking to sanitize an entire rack area, then you could be looking at several more. So it just depends on the application that it is that you're looking to um, use for that particular sanitization. Okay, um, interesting. Okay, so it's kind of like a case by case. So, but it sounds like it's uh, it's a pretty viable option for sanitization and maybe something that's not so as invasive and chemical um, heavy as the sprays. Absolutely, Uh, versatile. It's a uh, it's a great solution for um, needing to clean multiple different areas of yeah. a warehouse or a distribution center. Hmm. Interesting. 
Um, yeah, I, gotta, I guess uh, I guess my mom did something okay here. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She sounds to be pretty in tune with a safe way to keep you safe. Ah, uh, well, she's a mom, you know. She's I guess she's, she's got to keep me safe, you know, in that my my older age, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's awesome. But um, yeah, okay. So uh, I mean, it's pretty cool. I mean, I have seen like some different applications as well um, of the light. So, and I guess this is something too. I mean, because. I guess in like food service, like restaurants and stuff, I've seen like this light on the wall, this light thing, right? That's the same kind of thing, right? It can be. Yeah. So where you'll see it in like fast food applications typically is uh, above the ordering kiosks. Right. And so if you go to a fast food exa- a restaurant and, you know, you can punch in your own order and use the payment terminals there, mm-hmm. then often you'll see like a little bar that's about maybe 18 inches wide and it's got a little cover on the top of it. Um, and often mm-hmm. that's a UV light that's actually cleaning that kiosk mm-hmm. after you walk away. And uh, often it can be set so that it cleans after every user and it shuts off as soon as a user walks up. And so it maintains a safe, sanitized way for um, the orders to get placed and also minimizes the interaction between any employees that are working at this, the fast food establishment mm-hmm. um, between the employees and the customers themselves. It's a pretty cool solution. Interesting. Mm. Mm. Very cool. Um, so I'm curious, you know, uh, we talk a lot about the UV light here. I, I was very interested in it. Um, so, you know, what are, what are some other things, I guess, um, maybe some stranger requests that you've had <laughs> from customers, I guess, uh, both pre-COVID and post-COVID. And I'm curious, too, as well, because I've seen some things, um, I guess, just in per- like in regular life that... You know, some things that would seem like very strange prior to COVID, but now are actually just, they just seem normal. So I'm curious, what what have you seen like in the course of uh, business, I guess, over the, the last couple of months that's been a little, a little strange? Absolutely. So I think one of the, the most strange examples that we've seen was a request to sanitize people. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. uh, kind of not necessarily understanding, uh, you know, how UVC light works or the sanitization yeah. um, spray or any of that. And so that was uh, definitely an educational opportunity and uh, keeping people safe. Uh, but it, there's so many different instances where this could be a topic, mm-hmm. whether it be a photography studio. And we've had some requests for glare free partitions or uh, glare free um um, barriers that don't show up in a photo, right. but allow to have that physical barrier between the person taking the picture and the people who are being photographed. Um, in addition to that, we'll keep using the photography studio as an example, mm-hmm. being able to sanitize all of the surfaces that the people were in after the photography session is complete, whether it be a uh, velvet chair that they're sitting on or even a prop like a, my first birthday balloon, yeah. you know, keeping all of those surfaces sanitized and safe to use for the next um, uh <laughs> photography participant uh, is really yeah, important <laughs> and also a really unique situation. And as much as business is standardized, there's always going to be something unique that comes up. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if it's a, a warehouse that's offering or operating 24 seven, if they need to have access control into the warehouse by, you know, having their employees get their temperature taken before the door will even open. That's mm. become a topic of discussion, and I'm sure even a year ago, nobody expected to have their temperature taken in order to yeah, get into to work, their yeah. place of work or even into the restaurant or even into a Las Vegas casino. Yeah, to get a but haircut now it's, even, yeah. Yeah, now it's become, it's expected. Mm. Um, we mentioned robots earlier, and uh, the whole concept of being in the future right now is is really striking to me. Mm. So whether we're discussing discussing robots or whether we're discussing UVC light being as a way to clean something or whether we're talking about keeping people physically separated from each other. These are all points of discussion that we weren't necessarily hearing about even, you know, six, eight months ago uh, prior to COVID, uh, but now are absolutely um, a daily conversation topic. 
it's yeah. it's pretty interesting to just take a step back and look at some of the differences in the way that we do business and the way that we operate and uh, even the shopping habits of people. I think before, you know, a lot of people were apt to go to the store on their way home from work and pick up whatever they needed. Now we are definitely seeing data that supports that people are buying groceries for two, three weeks at a time. Mm -hmm. So not only are we talking about the difference in shopping habits of the individual, there's also the... Um, the ripple effect of how the supply chain and distribution center and retail storefronts need to change and adapt to accommodate the shift in the buying structure of the end user. It's a, it's a pretty massive conversation. It's uh, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. But I would yeah, say definitely crazy, when yeah, we're yeah. talking about stuff that was odd before, but mm. pretty normal now, definitely the temperature sensing is, yeah. uh, is probably the most common one. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy like to think back. I mean, I was even uh, watching a movie the other night and it was like kind of a recent movie and I'm like, I'm like, it's so weird to see people just like doing normal things like in the movie, right? like no, no masks or anything like that. Um, <laughs> Hugging. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like you, yeah. Like you mentioned like things are different, like how we do business, like even, um, you know, I have some people coming in and doing like job interview. I'm like, I don't know. How do I even greet you now? I don't even like don't shake your hand or like give you a fist bump or something. It's uh yeah, it's it's interesting how things have changed and so quickly I guess how, you know, most people have kind of adapted and like you said, even changed like their consumer behavior and things like that and how it's kind of driven driven this different aspects of the business and I mean it's kinda of created like a whole whole nother sub industry i guess of all these different applications like uh, you know you mentioned like doors that won't open unless you take your temperature and um actually you had one i went to the doctor and they had something set up like on the door and it was like mm -hmm. before you enter take your own temperature and there was nobody standing there like with a, a gun to take your temperature it was like you put your feet on this one and and it just reads your temperature like right there and I, that was pretty uh pretty cool and something you know like you said it would never uh thought about doing that before so, so absolutely a lot of them you don't even need to put your feet on or mm -hmm. uh, you know touch in any way shape or form it senses when the user walks up and yeah. you know within one second two seconds it either you know it takes your temperature and either opens the door we're actually seeing this in uh some pilots for um public transportation mm -hmm. so for example into a subway turnstile you know if is it going to let the user through mm -hmm. uh it's not going to let the user through unless they have a successful temperature read that's within the um, the yeah, parameter set on, the, on yeah. that particular device the possibilities are quite endless interesting hmm. yeah it's really really pretty interesting it'll be interesting to see how how everything uh evolves too as we get hopefully out of this in some capacity and uh, and then how that kind of like sticks, I guess, with us as society and how those different things kind of kind of evolve and maybe in the future help to help to control. Um, hopefully we don't have something like this again, uh, but it's probably <laughs> it's probably inevitable in the next hundred years or whatever. Um, but yeah, hopefully, you know, we have some more innovations in place that are like help help to kind of prevent it being such a widespread thing like it was this time. Um, I agree. Yeah. But I'll so. definitely for now at least uh and I assume for actually this will be the one of the things that sticks. Mm -hmm. Uh I'll enjoy the the contactless delivery and uh, the grocery delivery and the and the fast shipping. Oh yeah. Um, you know, we've definitely <laughs> lived in the culture of now for quite some time here and I think yeah. uh, this coronavirus uh, with COVID-19 has has ex exacerbated that for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely without a doubt. Um, so I'm curious now, uh, I guess, before we wrap up here, um, from an employee perspective, right? So we kind of talked a lot about solutions that uh, companies can put in place. And, you know, we talk a lot about like high touch areas like equipment and printers, um, um, timeout, time in clocks, punch in clocks as well. You know, how, how can, I guess, employees uh kind of individually be safe around using these high touch devices as well um, and then how can companies kind of help to enable them to take those own personal safe measures absolutely well of course the UVC light is is a great suggestion for mm -hmm. that but uh you know ultimately we 
can be responsible for our own safety too. So if that means disinfecting the device uh, in between users or in between shifts, whether it be wiping down a touch screen or a button or another commonly touched place on the device, that's definitely point A, you know, and then of course point B, C, D are all of the PPE that's become so commonplace now with the mask, right. the gloves, face shields, whatever is suitable for that particular environment. Uh, but regular disinfecting, whether it be the printers, whether it be the mobile computing, all of that stuff is definitely um, within our um, our control to be able to sanitize from a personal level, of course, with your company's uh, support. But even keeping a, a bottle of hand sanitizer next to print station uh, can be a really significant way to cut down on any risks associated with, um, you know, contamination of COVID from one person to the other. Of course, you know, having the times that are designated to wipe down high touch points, such as printers or sign-in devices, you know, is a, is a fantastic way to making sure that those devices are being sanitized. It's really easy to assume that the next person is going to do it or that it's going to being done regularly, but ask your employer. Mm -hmm. Hey, can we set a schedule or is there a schedule that is set in order to have stuff sanitized, wiped down, secured, uh, but also maintaining that six foot distance can be crucial, um, which is often supported by having designated workbenches or mm -hmm. stations. Uh, we were talking earlier about one to one with a mobile computer or a printer that really helps um, uh, employees keep that six foot distance between each other right. or even converting from stationary printing or desktop printing to either a mobile cart with that desktop or industrial printer uh, or even using a mobile printer. Uh, a lot of the mobile printers that are out there now will easily accommodate the four inch wide labels that are commonly used in warehouse distribution centers. So having each employee designated with a mobile printer is a great is a great way to handle that too. Uh, we talked earlier about having a 24-7 um, environment in a warehouse. So staggering the shifts or having designated print times also helps that. Uh, and then we also have to remember that a lot of the technology has been designed to be used uh, hands-free or has been designed to use without having too many um, back steps or, uh, you know, re-steps or whatever it may be. And so being able to use hands-free printing by utilizing your mobile computer to assign a print job or do a print command um, is really, really, really helpful. You know, of course, we can't forget the option to have pre-printing. And so in some instances, like a shipping label, there's no way that could be pre-printed ahead of time by a third party. But uh, there are definitely instances where using a third party source to pre-print labels for you, whether it be product application labels or locationing labels, all of those things can often be done offsite and then uh, having a single person going and uh, applying those particular role of labels helps uh, eliminate multiple hands touching that roles. Mm. But if we are talking about shared printers, you know, there's definitely other ways to eliminate having more than necessary touches on a particular printer. So, for example, you can use label stacks instead of rolls. Uh, a lot of the industrial printers that are used in warehouses have a little slot in the back of the printer and allows, allows you or the user to use a stack of labels, which can have thousands upon thousands of labels on there. And uh, that helps reduce the amount of times that that stack needs to be changed versus a roll of labels that may only have, you know, six or 800 labels mm. on a particular roll. So it minimizes the amount of time that roll needs to be changed. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Really um, interesting tips there and some stuff I haven't even uh, thought of as well. So, so thank you for uh, sharing that. Um, of course. Very welcome. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm curious too, before, uh, before we wrap up, what the customer that wanted to sanitize people, what, what, mm -hmm. what was the ultimate solution? <laughs> Uh, the ultimate solution was to have the physical barrier in place okay. and also to sanitize the actual touch points that were going between the employee as well as the patron. And so, for example, there were 
um, clipboards and pens and things like that that were being transferred from one to the other. So having the physical barrier, it was actually a floor barrier um, that separated the person and the patron, um, as well as having another barrier on the desk itself that had a little cutout on the top of the desk where it connected to the um the shield that allowed for items to be passed in between. So making sure that those um, uh, common touch items were being sanitized in between and keeping a physical distance between the employee and the, the patron. So we didn't actually have to sanitize the person itself. We got a little bit more creative. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like interesting, interesting. Um, so how, how can people find out more information about uh, Peak Rizex? Absolutely. So the easiest way to find out more about us is by visiting our website, which is www.peak-risex.com. And you are welcome to email us anytime at info at peak-risex.com or call us at 888-444-9128. All right, great. Thank you very much, Jen. And we'll definitely put that information on the newerhouse.com as well. Um, so thank you so much for all the insights and uh, tips on cleaning and interesting stories as well. Thank you a lot. Of course. Thanks, Kevin. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. And uh, I look forward to seeing what solutions are next. <laughs> You've been listening to the New Warehouse Podcast with Kevin Lawton. Subscribe and check us out online at thenewwarehouse.com. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you want more content from The New Warehouse, check out our new video series called All Hands on LinkedIn. Just search for The New Warehouse on LinkedIn and follow along.